Hello, I'm Eric Topol, Editor-in-Chief of Medscape. And with me today is Professor John Ioannidis uh, from Stanford, who I've been dying to have a chat with for a long time. So, so glad that we could get together. So, John, welcome. Thank you, Eric. It's a great pleasure to have a chance to chat with you. Yeah, so I've been following your work and your career for a number of years, and uh, you are the contrarian of medicine, uh, and I say that in a positive way. Uh, well, I just want to maybe get a little bit of background, because I didn't know until I finally get the chance to have this interview with you, some of your background as far as in, in high school being a math prodigy, getting the national award in Greece, and being a son of two physician researchers. So you, you seem like you were made for this role you have in terms of the conscience of uh, biomedicine. Can you tell me how you got your kind of roots in this um, uh, whole um, model that you, that you really espouse? So I, I think that I had a lot of exposure to science from early on, and uh, I loved lots of different aspects of uh, the, the scientific method and scientific disciplines, all the way from mathematics and biology and uh, bench research and clinical research and clinical epidemiology. I was always very unfocused. I wanted to try my hands on different types of, uh, of research. I realized that I was making errors again and again in almost everything that I was trying. Um, and I started realizing that other people were also making errors and uh, <laughs> both in the lab and in clinic and uh, in published literature. Errors are common, they're human. Uh, some of them probably are more common than they should be. But you got to the point where it was like 90% of medical research is flawed. I mean, that kind of gets depressing, right? Well, I think that uh, one can see it half empty or half full or 10% uh, full or maybe a little bit more. Um, I think that uh, medicine has made tremendous progress and is still making progress. Uh, and I, I think that one could focus on that. The question is, how can we improve the efficiency of uh, what we're doing? How can we decrease the error rate? How can we be less frequently misled and waste effort, resources, our time, our ideas, uh, our best uh, uh, people uh, down blind alleys? So in a way, I think that if we see the positive message that we can identify problems and we can get rid of them, uh, I see that as very optimistic. Uh, it's wonderful to have all these errors floating around ready to be detected and uh, corrected. Well, that's, as I think you put it, the scourge of sloppy science. But what about the fact that you, you're an editor of a journal, right? The uh, European Journal of Clinical Investigation. Yeah. I imagine you get submitted to your journal the same kind of sloppy, flawed <laughs> journal. How do you deal with that? Um, so I, I think that um, uh, being an editor is uh, like the last stop. Uh, it's uh, it is a, maybe a last opportunity to try to fix uh, something, and I think it's a bit late. Uh, for example, of course, uh, we we do reject about ninety percent of the submissions that we get in our, in my journal, and I think that I do my best uh, to keep the impact factor as low as possible with publishing uh, papers that are not flashy and uh, don't have extreme claims. Uh, so I I try to penalize my journal as much as I can. Uh, but still, it's, that's pretty late in the process. Uh, by the time you have a paper uh, that is submitted somewhere, either in my journal or in any journal, it will be published. There's nothing that can stop it. There's, uh, there's nothing, no matter how flawed it is, no matter how bad it is, no matter how misleading it is, it will find a home sooner or later. So, John, there's about 2 million papers published every year, and most of them are never read. Maybe that's good that they're never read, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think that uh, probably there's more than two million. If you take uh, not just biomedicine, but all science, probably it's close to four or five million. And uh, uh, what is a paper is something that, that can be heavily debated at the moment. You know, what kind of unit of information it is and, and what is the expected value. The expected value of the average paper is unfortunately very close to zero. Uh, not exactly zero, but, <laughs> but very close to that. But you've been on a crusade, and you have hit on, you know, almost every discipline. Uh, you know, genetics, uh, psychology, neuroscience, uh, clinical trials, drug companies. I mean, the whole lot. And then, most recently, I noticed you even went after economics in November. <laughs> Is there anything that's left that you haven't haven't worked over? 
So th this is the, the great fun and the, the, the great opportunity in, in working on meta research or research and research. One very quickly realizes that research methods and research practices and the way that they're applied or transformed, uh, they're pretty similar across very different disciplines. The scientific method is pretty unique. There is heterogeneity in the way that different disciplines have preference for some aspects of it or how exactly to operationalize it. But we can learn a lot by comparing notes because uh, if you look at different fields, you realize that some of the big problems that we face in biomedicine may have been solved in other fields pretty easily and maybe a done deal. Uh, vice versa, one could probably transplant some good ideas from biomedical disciplines to other fields in other domains of biomedicine or in other fields way beyond biomedicine. Uh, the concepts are very similar and uh, the manifestations are different. And obviously the consequences are different because in medicine it's about lives and, and people dying because of uh, suboptimal information. Right. And I think that's a really important uh, point about the wide angle lens that you've applied to. The, it is much broader than just medicine. And I give you a lot of credit for that and you identifying these common threads. Now, the problem we have in medicine though, is this evidence basis, which as you've, I think, really proven over the course of these years is so shaky, is so tenuous. And here we are trying to make decisions uh, in, in taking care of patients and selecting treatments and tests and whatnot. What, what are we going to do since most of the evidence is, is uh, baseless? Well, some evidence is reliable. There, there's a gradient. I think that there are some treatments, some interventions, some uh, policies that uh, we have very strong evidence that it is so, and we need to do something about it. And if we don't, it would be really stupid. Uh, not just for interventions, but also for, for risk factors, you know, even in observational epidemiology, uh, no one would deny that uh, smoking is, is, uh, is horrible and it's going to kill one billion people unless we get rid of it. Uh, we don't need randomized trials to, uh, to prove that. Uh, but, uh, of course, there's the other end of the gradient where there's a lot of unreliable evidence. There's a lot of evidence that's very tenuous. Uh, I think that we need to train people to understand what are the limitations. Uh, what are the caveats, how much they can trust uh, or distrust uh, what they read or what they see, what they're being told to do, and at a second step, make them ask for better evidence. I think that uh, there's no reason why we should accept that we will continue to live with suboptimal evidence. I think that clinicians and clinical researchers should be at the forefront for that because they, they realize on a daily basis what are the issues where they don't have evidence that they can trust? And then they can create the questions to try to answer uh, what type of evidence do we need and how are we going to get it in coordination with methodologies? Well, this brings up something that just happened yesterday. One of the t areas that you also have tackled is nutritional science, if you want to call it that. And there was this paper in the New England Journal that you probably saw about the Mediterranean diet. And it was a trial that is the largest trial of a randomized diet with hard outcomes, published back in 2013. And now the New England Journal retracted it and republished it in the same day. It had all sorts of irregularities. What's your take on this? Because it's right up your alley as to flawed science. So uh, nutrition is clearly a mess. And uh, I have long advocated that we can fix some of that mess by running large-scale, long-term, randomized trials with clinical endpoints. So PREDIMED uh, was a trial that tried to do that. It, it was pretty much the exception compared to all that irreproducible mess of nutritional epidemiology. I was very happy to see it published. I, I was very excited that at, at last we're making some progress. But unfortunately, PREDIMED uh, seemed to take the path of observational epidemiology in publishing zillions of papers uh, with results that were far more tenuous and I think that what we saw in the retraction was a signal that the data had major flaws. Uh, clearly, the retraction was the right thing to do. However, even after the retraction, I don't feel that we have seen the whole story. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the problem that was detected by the statistical analysis with the baseline characteristics being so similar that this cannot happen by chance is not something that is explained by the correction that led to the republication, which means that uh, uh, there's no reason why, uh, if indeed 
a whole village was randomized as an entity instead of uh, on an individual base, or some couples were randomized as two people rather than individuals, that should not have led to that pattern that was detected by testing the baseline characteristics. So my strong belief is that PREDIMED is a seriously flawed trial. I cannot trust it any longer. I love olive oil. I love... I was just, yeah, you're Greek. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry. I cannot trust it. I think that there's, there's major problems that go beyond the retraction. And actually, we're working at the moment at looking at some of that. And hopefully, we'll publish some evidence showing that there's deeper problems in that. That's really important because, you know, my sense, um, not that I'm uh, Greek or Mediterranean in origin, but I had been influenced by prior studies like the Lyon heart study which was you know, fairly well done and, and a smaller trial and albeit a secondary prevention. But it just goes, I think, to prove your point, and that's why it's such an opportune time to talk to you. Here is a very high profile journal, uh, New England Journal, an article, and here it retracts and republishes the same day. Something's wrong with our system of evidence, right? Clearly, and I think that uh, uh, just republishing a trial with seemingly the same results is not going to fix it. In the case of uh, PREDIMED, I would argue that uh, one would have to obtain all the raw data, uh, not the clean data, the raw data before arbitration for an independent committee to analyze. And I think that if this were to happen, uh, my bet would be that the effect sizes would shrink or even go away. Uh, I would hate to see that. I, I would like to bet against my own prediction. But I think that there's some very serious problems when we trust trials that uh, have no transparency, they have uh, no openness, they are not willing to share, uh, they're not willing to go through reanalysis, they're not willing to uh, have some independent scrutiny on what is going on. And this is still the majority of randomized trials being published, uh, both in New England Journal of Medicine and in other journals as well. But wouldn't you have thought that the editors of the New England Journal, particularly through this unprecedented thing, would, would have uh, raked over this data and raked over the investigators as to the getting to transparency and truth? I, I, I would have hoped so. And I still hope so that, you know, they will uh, allow some further probing into this trial, which is like uh, an opportunity. I, I think it would be a lost opportunity if we don't learn more, because I think it's just the, the tip of the iceberg. There's, there's far more that's going on. And I think that PREDIMED actually may be the most honest in a way compared to other trials that may be less honest. Well, that, that's saying a lot right there. Now, one of the things that you brought up is it's not just about financial conflicts of interest, but you've emphasized in some of your writings about the intellectual conflict of interest. And I think it's really important. And so for the most part, people don't really understand that, the bias and the fact that so many careers are, are uh, tagged to a particular you know, belief system and, and, and uh, a pursuit. Uh, but one of the things that as a critique is that, oh, well, well, John, he is, you know, this is his role. He, he is the takedown artist, if you will. And that's, you know, <laughs> that's an intellectual conflict. How do you respond to that charge? I think that I'm biased. I think that this is unavoidable. And I think that people should take that for granted when they read my work and then when they read uh, other scientists' work. Uh, we all have some priors. And I think that sometimes it is possible to to track these priors based on what we have published. I don't think that it is wrong to have opinions. I don't think it's wrong to have hypotheses. I don't think that it's wrong uh, even to have beliefs. Uh, to be honest, when I launch a new project, uh, I try to be as open as possible to all types of outcomes. Uh, if anything, my bias is more towards getting non-significant results. Uh, I think if I get significant results, even if it is about bias, I have to ask myself, why did I get that? Could it be that I was wrong? Could it be that I need to go back and recheck the process and find some errors? And sometimes I have found errors in the process and hopefully early enough uh, so as uh, not to publish that. I think what makes a scientist is an acknowledgement that he or she can be biased and has to watch out for that possibility in whatever we do. Right. No, that's great. I think it's a really a terrific answer. Now, 
one of the things I was surprised about, because usually you come out on the negative side of almost everything, is about preprints. You were pretty positive on preprints. Tell us why that's the case. So preprints are uh, one opportunity to disseminate uh, research broadly uh, in an earlier uh, fashion and to open that research to criticism at an early stage to the entire scientific community. Uh, one might argue, well, there's no peer review. And I'm a strong supporter of the need for peer review, but peer review is a suboptimal set of tools. Uh, probably it improves substantially about 20% of the papers that get submitted. It makes about 5% of the papers worse. And 75% uh, of the papers probably don't change much other than just uh, linguistic, uh, stylistic, or, or a few words changing now, now and then. So if we could have a system that information is available early on to the entire scientific community to scrutinize, to comment, to make suggestions on how to improve it before we have the quote-unquote definitive paper, I think this is a good thing. Provided that people realize that this is uh, just early dissemination of information and uh, it has to be taken with an extra level of caution. Yeah, the only concern I've had about the preprints, I'm a big fan, uh, is that some disciplines are now considering this as the final submission. That is, particularly in artificial intelligence, so many papers are submitted without any intent of trying to go through the peer review process. Not that the peer review is so great, but at least there's another layer of, of uh, you know, independent uh, assessment of, of findings and whatnot. So it's great to get your views. Now, I just want to make sure that I've um, given you a chance to, you know, give your perspective. I, what, what I think is remarkable, uh, John, is that you are so really have taken a, a, the role as a conscience of, of the field. Uh, it's, it's bigger than biomedical research, and your work has just been so impactful. The, the number one article ever cited in, in uh, Public Library of Science and so many other journals as well. Um, but do you, you think now that, that your work that you've done of exposing the problems, you know, where do you go from here? Just do more of the same, or how do you get this thing on track? My, my uh, wish is not to expose problems. I mean, obviously, there's lots of problems, and so it's not a, a big deal uh, to uh, point out to another one. <laughs> there, there's no end to them. My wish is to try to fix problems, and uh, I, I want to make sure that the work that I do and the work that others who work with me uh, take as a direction is towards solutions rather than uh, just identifying the issues. So much of the work that I have been doing at uh, the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford over the last uh, uh, four years uh, has focused on identifying solutions. Solutions may not be easy to document and to find evidence to support them. So much like interventions in medicine or in any other specialty, we need evidence about proposed solutions. One may come up with lots of ideas, but some of them may be horrible. Others may be kind of neutral and may not really make any difference, and some of them may really work. The good thing is that scientists in general want to get science to a better shape. I, I don't think that uh, people want to hide things under the carpet. So many scientific uh, communities do come with solutions and do implement them and do test them out, and they do see major improvements in the credibility and the transparency of their work. So it's, uh, it's an issue of... Uh, making sense of the options, prioritizing them, testing them out, getting rid of uh, the false leads, and uh, making further progress. If, uh, if you can think of 1% improvement because of adopting a better scientific process across science, this is tremendous progress. It, it could be the equivalent of translating to tens of millions of lives saved. Now, yeah. 1% progress. Terrific point. And, you know, I just noted that they're recently using algorithms to screen papers with respect to statistics, uh, using AI, in fact, or like the human being that detected the problem with the Mediterranean study and, uh, and several other articles, this may be one of the many, many ways we can go on to the fix that you're referring to. So uh, in closing, John, I want to thank you, not just for this interview, but for the bigger picture of the role you've played in medicine. That you've taught us so much. You've really had a uh, fantastic uh, effect of uh, like a wake-up call 
And it's been not just one time, it's all the time. And every time I see something that's seriously flawed or possibly flawed, I think about you. So thanks for all your effort and your continued uh, pursuit of, uh, you know, evidence that's real, excellence in, in research, and uh, good luck to, uh, to continued success for you and your colleagues at Stanford. Thank you, Eric. It was a great pleasure to talk with you, and uh, I hope that we will have more good news next time. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for joining.